Welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name is Simon Hodgkins and it's a pleasure to be joined by Umit Appenzella. Umit, you're very welcome to the podcast. Let's begin by asking you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your world. So over to you, Umit. Thanks very much indeed, Simon. You know, after having met you just an audio, it's a pleasure to be here on your show. It's really a great honour. And my name is Umit Appenzella and... Um, I'm stationed in Germany, I've lived around the world and um, I'm a brand value advisor. And yeah, that's it basically. Well, let, let's talk about brands because I know uh, you have quite a few thoughts and feelings about brands. You're advising in this, in this area and brand strategy is probably more important now than it's ever been. A lot of brands are looking for attention. They're looking to create purpose. There's a lot of things that are important to brands now. Uh, they they certainly want to um, expand internationally and globally. And um, what are you seeing from the landscape? Because you've been involved in this area for quite a number of years now. Uh, but you must have seen some changes, whether that was pandemic driven or whether it's just the, the evolving landscape of how brands are needing to communicate in today's hectic technology paced world. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for this really very extensive question, Simon. Um, I started my career very traditionally in the automotive business. So that was a long time ago. And um, we started to set up uh, the topic of branding and we made some uh, approaches to a very successful board. And that until that time wasn't really used to what's brands are doing and what brands are about and um, so basically um, we set up a cl very classical brand management so we started you know with a vision with a mission with the values and the strategy that was derived from that and we worked together very closely with agencies and we used to work very closely with market research, because at the end of the day, if you have a product, if you have a um, service, or if you even have an intangible asset, you know, you need to be able to describe your brand and you need to be able to describe it and to communicate it in such a way that the consumer, that your customer knows what to expect. It's it's like a big surprise and it's a big um like a promise, like it's a, it's a very big promise that you make to your to your audience. And I think the journey from like 15, 20 years ago until now has on one side changed dramatically in a technological sense, but on the other side, as far as the core values of a brand are concerned, they're still the same. So we have brands that are, for example, like 100, 200 years old, like Guinness, for example, or if you take Mercedes-Benz, or for example, if you take like uh, Cartier, or if you take like um, so many other brands that are really, really old. Um, so their topic, their, their main DNA hasn't changed but they have responded in a way to the transformation of times ages and the surrounding world in a way that they could take their customer base their brand lovers along with them so i think the transformation process is is really the most important thing so um brand owners should also refocus on their existing customer journey they have to look these days to the pre-purchase to the purchase itself and also to the post-purchase and um i think that particularly luxury brands are really spearheading in this context you know and um if you're smart enough you can just look at how all these um different measures can trickle down also the premium pyramid because if you look at the luxury level you look at the premium level and you look at the mainstream level um if, if the company has the resources to respond to the transformation and i'm not speaking only pre-pandemic i mean this journey has been now going on for a couple of years because with the advent of you know all this social media i think brands had to respond in a very efficient and a very distinctive way to to their to their audience yeah that's interesting and i suppose just 
just bringing it back to some of the core areas that you do work on as well, though, because from brand analytics, sports and lifestyle, which is kind of your 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 area uh, and your um, the work that you're involved in. I, my question is about companies that want to roll out into the German market. Yeah. Uh, um, so for companies yeah. that want to maybe yeah. find their audience or need help in developing their brand in Germany, you know, then whether that's a French company, an Irish company, a UK company, an American company, or whatever, where any part of the world, rolling out a brand strategy in Germany, I know you have some clear thoughts and, uh, you know, you work in that area quite a lot. So is there any sort of insights you can give us or is there any sort of things that brands normally get wrong that you'd like to maybe share with us today? Um, I could share some things with you without naming any brands or any companies. And to be quite honest, I think you hit it right on the nail because that's where the chaff has to be separated from the wheat. Because, for example, let's say hypothetically you have a brand leader in a Southeast European market that's very successful. That's maybe the brand leader or that's maybe among the top five of their market. Let's say hypothetically it's men's apparel. So everything from men from, from top to toe. So they're doing really well in their market and they're thinking to themselves, okay, let's, 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 let's try this. Let's go a bit west further west so let's enter some markets that are bordering our country and they're hugely successful in these countries let's say these countries are hungary romania moldavia or serbia and and again they're again very very successful in these markets they enter the markets they hit the nail on the head. They become very successful because either there is no competitors on the market or the design is extremely appealing or the quality is just overwhelming or it's a sum of all of these. And, um, and again, you are being confirmed in your own success story. So you are in your brand silo, you're used to the success, you're used that whatever you can roll out it will be, you know, really, really successful. And then you'll think to yourself as a brand owner or as a board, well, why don't we go even further west? Why don't we go to Germany, to Austria, to Switzerland? And um, what's also very important is if you enter different markets, you know, sometimes if companies have the resources and the trust to do some market research, they know exactly what the consumers are like and what their main focus will be. Is it the price? Is it sustainability? Is it eco-sustainability? Is it like reusability? Um, but sometimes some brands are rather very, um, very confident about themselves and they think they don't have to do all these research. So when they enter further to the West, to Germany, for example, they think, wow, Germany is the biggest economy in Europe. Germany, the, the purchasing power is just amazing. And so we will enter the market and our price strategy will be just extremely, extremely appealing. And what happens then is a big surprise. Even if the quality is perfect, even if the design is overwhelming, even if the packaging, the, the value chain along the entire customer journey, according to them, and I think that's now the differentiator, according to them, is really, really amazing. They don't sell. Nobody wants to buy their products. Nobody even knows about their brands. Nobody is interested in their brands. And then the journey starts where the board will say, um, wow, what's wrong with the Germans? I mean, this is a good product compared to other products. And it's, let's say, 25% um, less expensive than the next competitor. But nobody buys our stuff. We're prime location. We're dishing out just so much money on our leases. We're there. We're in the middle of the hub. But nobody wants to buy a product. So what went wrong? Question mark. So I can tell you from my experience that that's exactly... Um, where the chaff needs to be separated from the wheat because entering a market 
does really require a lot of homework, especially a very saturated market like the German market, where we have a very strong eco-oriented consumer attitude, where people want to know where does the cotton come from? Where has this product been woven? Where did how are the labor conditions of these apparel that we buy? And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes a lot of brand owners do. And uh, we're just seeing a couple of them exiting the market again. So they have been not really very successful. But again, it's always the entry strategy. So if you're a company and you have a certain budget, let's say you have a seven digit budget or an eight digit budget and you say, okay, let's give it a go. Let's try this out, whether this works or it doesn't work, then it's fine. But most of the time, these brands rather want to conquer the market. They want to establish themselves. They want to become one of the major players on the market. Does this answer your question, Simon? It, it does. And I think outside of language, obviously, which is a large component of going into any country, what you're also talking about, though, is sort of the almost the ethics of a brand, the, the, the supply chain of a brand, all these new factors that are important to consumers today. So whether it's diversity, inclusion, uh, where the goods are sourced, how are they manufactured, uh, and then you get into pricing and language and culture. Um, it's quite a complex situation. And that's why I suppose having somebody on the ground that understands the culture that is local to that country or area that a brand is trying to expand into is so critical, isn't it? Because often, as you say, you were kind of talking about this at the start, that just because you're successful in your whole market does not guarantee that success when you start looking at other geographical uh, locations on the map. And um, it, it is really, really fascinating to, to see some companies that are very successful maybe in their home markets, but then move into Germany, spend a lot of money, miss some obvious points, and then have to pull out. And that's a huge cost. And we see that probably more so in global news with American companies entering, say, the Chinese market, giving it a few years, and then having to retreat out because they're not making progress for lots of the reasons I think that you are you're you're speaking about there. And what is it what is it about you mentioned apparel there and sort of sportswear and what is it about the sports and leisure sector that 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 uh, is a particular focus area of yours? Because originally it was automotive, whether it was Mercedes, you know, Daimler, et cetera. Yeah. How did you yeah. sort of morph into that sort of sportswear because you know athleisure and sporting brands now are probably some of the biggest well-known brands on the on the planet so how did you get into that area um morph morph into that area is really nice and um, i think if you look at products these days especially luxury luxury products i think you have to look at the entire habitat of a product so it's not only the product it's the entire galaxy the entire universe so it's all intertwined you know whether it's fashion whether it's sport whether it's health and well-being and i think that's changed really dramatically the past 10 years because you know this hedonistic lifestyle that we have um acquired especially in western societies and having lived in asia i know the difference between a hedonistic lifestyle and a lifestyle and a cultural attitude towards the community, which is totally, totally different. And um, and I think it just evolved really naturally because I've always been interested in football. I grew up in Northern Bavaria in Franconia and um, one part of growing up was obviously, you know, when you live in the same place for the first 20 years of your life, and it's like the 70s, the 80s, and you're very much influenced by music, by sports. It has something to do with your DNA. It has to do something with your own upbringing. And I love the influence because my upbringing was very much influenced by American music and by brick pop. So we didn't have, at that time, um, any TikTok. We didn't have social media. But what we did have was AFN, American Forces Network. And we have the charts. So I would go into a record store, where well, you don't say record store anymore, you say vinyl, obviously, these days. 
and you know and you would browse you know with your fingers you would browse through all the covers and everything and um it's always about discovering it's discovering new areas of life and it's a journey that you are entering and um it's got to do something with your own personality, whether you're a risk taker, whether you want to find out new things and how knowledgeable, knowledgeable you would like to become. And, and I think it's all mixed together. So I was very much influenced by music and obviously um, Britpop and also football. And remembering, you know, the 80s with all the hooligans in, in the UK, it was a bit of a shock because it was a very, very dark, culture it was but it was the the purest form of football passion because i think and still until this day there is no other country in the world that has this deeply embedded football passion in their dna like the uk it's something completely different you go to the stadiums the way you sit in the stadiums the customer journey you know it's just like it's completely different than for example for example in germany and we're not speaking about the US because they have soccer, but that doesn't really have to do anything with the archetype of football. So that started quite early in my life. And when I entered a man domain, you know, entering the automotive industry at that time as a young woman and being really imbued with a lot of responsibility, because I started there as a personal assistant to a board member, you're thrown into the cold water, you're thrown under the bus from day one, and you just have to be very resilient, you have to be very, very strong, and you have to be very determined. And I think the only way to survive is to become better than the others, to become more knowledgeable, and to reflect and listen very, very carefully to what you learn. And I think the learning journey is, probably the most important lesson that I've learned throughout my life. And now circling back to sports, um, I started doing brand analysis for football clubs a couple of years ago. And um, it's very interesting because you have the football world in Germany from the outside. And then when you have the privilege, like I did, I had a very short stint within a football club and you look into the inside, you're quite surprised because from the outside, you know, there is a lot of bling and there is a lot of, there is a lot of, you know, economic power going on. And it, there is a lot of commercial transformation going on. But when you delve inside, sometimes you're quite surprised to what extent the professionalism is really dictating and dominating everyday business because at the end of the day nowadays the football clubs need to survive by just looking at the tables and it's just like a bit of a hamster race you know it's just like who's number one who's number two who's leading the table who will be relegated who wants to buy this player so we've also seen a massive shift there and my approach has always been to say look at your brand dna look at your pyramid look at your vision what is your mission and what are your values and what is your brand heritage? But that Simon is written on a different page because it's very, very difficult to get into the depths of this. Because first of all, it's a it's a men dominated business. And I think if you talk about branding and football, um, except for the UK, obviously, because they're really spearheading. I would say in every aspect, because Manchester United, for example, you know, they have 20 years ago, I used to live in Singapore and um, David Beckham popped by with his family and there is a shop, Man United shop on uh, Orchard Road in Singapore. So they started, they were the first ones to start with merchandising. They were the first ones to start really to commercialize their players. Fascinating, um, fascinating, Umid. And what's coming across is you're obviously a student of culture because whether it, I know prior to uh, Daimler, uh, you were in, in the World Bank for a few years, and yeah. you know you you sort of moved into Daimler for around I don't know ten, fifteen years, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, 
you've also lived in various parts of the world. You're talking there about Singapore and the Man United brand. And it is interesting because when you were talking, you you were talking about the word football, for example. And if you say that in the US, it's it's American football, right? It's NFL. Where yeah. the, soccer would be the term that maybe they would use. But in uh, obviously in the UK and Germany and Europe, um, football is the, the football that you're referring to. And I was thinking of Apple TV's show, you know, Ted Lasso, which is very popular, where they've got sort of this American coach coming over, getting to grips of, uh, I suppose, the premiership. Um, and it, it is quite uh, funny and comedic in parts because uh, there is that cultural gap, isn't there? Um, and what comes through, the reason I'm mentioning that TV series is because what comes through is that is there's some common human threads. There's some common things like empathy and understanding and listening and caring and all those sort of traits that a brand has to sort of bring through, regardless of which country or culture they're in. And sometimes that's the tricky bit. Uh, because as you say, from the outside, it can be very commercial, very bling, very, you know, look very different. And when you go back inside, sometimes their values aren't aligned. Sometimes they've got major gaps in what they're trying to do. And other times they they don't have that local knowledge to help them weave a path through all those international markets. So I think it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and obviously all your experiences, whether it's Daimler or the World Bank or whether it's what you're doing now, uh, which is very in depth working with uh, brands, particularly in sports and lifestyle. Um, it must all come together for you, um, Umit. It sounds like you're perfectly placed uh, to be doing the work that you're doing. You know, so it's back to that word morphing. I suppose it seems to be an ideal sweet spot for you. Yeah, I think it's it's something that comes really very natural. It's something that comes intrinsically. And you made a very important point. I think the cultural aspect and the cultural penetration of a brand in the market is probably the most overlooked aspect of any company or of any business, because you have sometimes like takeovers and you were mentioning like American companies also coming into Europe not in the sports business, but for example, in the fashion business. I suppose that a lot of people won't even remember Gap, famous Gap entering the German market in the late 90s. So that was really, really huge. And they entered the German market and I think two and a half years later, they exited with no noise. And why? Because they thought Gap is just so popular in the US and it was at that time was it's for me still a culture brand you know they are still going through the transformation and it was really sad news last year when they announced they're going to leave you know the UK and other European markets um, but again you have huge brands with a huge heritage and they think they can just swipe over other countries and just conquer them and it just doesn't work so a lot of money was lost when they entered the German money and left again. I think even nowadays, it's much more important to focus on the cultural aspect. You have to understand the cultural DNA of your company and you have to understand the cultural um, organism of your brand. So what are the individual atomic compositions of a brand you know like I was mentioning this one brand um to you uh, men's apparel and um, it's a great brand and and I think they have a huge potential especially now with the sad news of yesterday where scotch and soda announced that they're entering insolvency and they're looking for some solutions uh on the Dutch home market but it will definitely also have some effect on the on the German market and these are chances that other brands could fill in actually but then again most of them are quite short-sighted and for me you mentioned in the beginning purpose i think purpose has become one of the biggest key differentiators of success for any brand well thank you for all the insights Sumit. i want to change gear a little bit now because i like to ask my guests a little bit about themselves so we can understand how they work a little bit better and how they think. And one of the questions I like to ask is about your learning style. Are you constantly searching the web for information? Are you on social media a lot? Do you read books, whether it's for business or for pleasure? 
uh, or are you just turning on Netflix? I mean, how does it work for you? How do you get your information? What's your learning style like? That's a very good question. Um, well, first of all, I'm a mother. So my learning style has been really dominated by raising two children who are Gen Z, by the way. So I'm, I'm in a daily learning rhythm. So um, that's the biggest challenge probably these days. And it keeps you really um, updated about what's happening in the world and also to change your perspective and to look at the glass from a different angle, you know. But other than that, I think I would say I'm a very avid reader. I love visuals. I do love infographics and I do love to work with um, with numbers. Metrics have always been very, very important to me. And I'm not so much the type of audio, I have to honestly say. I mean, I love to listen to people, but most of the people are quite generic in what they in what they produce. And um, so, for example, it's always like follow your passion. You can become anything you want. And um, I'm always fascinated by women. I'm fascinated by uh, Michelle Obama, for example, and the way she talks, the way she tells stories, because at the end of the day, we're all storytellers. And um, I have a son who's studying, um, he studied um, artificial intelligence and computer science, and he's now doing his master's degree in philosophy. And I think the biggest gift are children that you can listen to and you can learn from because you know sometimes you have been raised in a completely different setup also cultural setup and then you listen to your children and they come up with totally different perspectives i'm not talking about this finger pointing boomers versus gen z but it's about you know the free will about consumption what does consumption actually mean? And we're all marketers. You know, at the end of the day, if you're really honest to yourself, as marketers, we need to drive growth. We need to drive revenue. But at the same time, we're looking at all the developments in the world and at all the disasters. So something is in imbalance and we need to change a couple of things. And this can only happen through education. We need to re-educate ourselves and we need to repurpose our resources so um that's for me really important you know the exchange with with younger generations yeah it it is um really good to hear you answer that question in the way that you did because i don't think anybody's actually mentioned that they're you know they learn a lot from their children and i think it's so important because whether it's uh, you know, you're talking about boomers or Gen Z or, you know, Gen X, et cetera, but uh, Gen A even coming through, um, they're growing up in a world that has mobile devices, has technology, AI, um, you know, by the time Gen A's kick in, it's just the norm. Um, and I think the implications for brands who aren't listening, um, it's going to be a very, very challenging time. We see it, don't we, with terrestrial television, uh, we see the changes and how people used to stay in at a particular time to watch a particular program. That just doesn't exist anymore. You know, people moved on. And I think brands in a similar, if I can draw a, a parallel to that, I think brands that aren't listening to the generations that are coming through, that are in school today, that are possibly joining the workforce in the next few years, they have a very different approach to the way they consume brands, the brands that they will and won't consume with, and also how they how they use media and how they use the tools. So I, I really liked your answer. It's it's um it's it's quite unique, and nobody's actually taken that perspective. So thanks for sharing that, Uma. Oh, you're most welcome. <laughs> The, uh, the other thing I'd like to ask people is about people that they admire. Um, so I'm always keen to point out that you don't have to mention people. If people spring to mind, we'd love to hear about them. It might just be a personality or a character trait. But when I ask you about people that you admire, people that have inspired you, or maybe people that have given you a helping hand along the way, what springs to mind? 
Oh, it springs to mind that um, very spontaneously, um, I was doing an internship um, at the International Labour Organization in the 80s. And I used to work there in a department um, called um, Equipro. And one of their jobs at the International Labour Organization was to evaluate the working conditions around the world. And my job was to type in at that time with huge computers and huge keyboards, um, different aspects of um, the logistics world. And at the same time, I would also go into the Palais, uh, the United Nations Palais, and do the simultaneous translation and listen. And my teacher at that time was a fantastic person called Hans Eberstark. And Hans Eberstark was also the founder of Mensa, which is the Worldwide Association of Highly Gifted People. And I mean, I was around 20 and Hans was probably at that time, mid fifties. Yeah, mid fifties or even over 60. And um, so it was a huge guy. He was a tall, huge guy. And we would always have lunch together. And I sometimes, very first time I felt a bit embarrassed because he was a huge big guy and his tie was always loose and he would really eat up everything and um, I was always a very slow eater and I would never ever finish my plate never ever and he would always ask me whether he could finish my plate and I was a bit surprised you know it, it, it was for me like why would he ask me that and I said yeah sure go ahead Hans and then he could see my reaction and um he told me that it just gives him pain, physical, emotional pain, if somebody doesn't finish his plate because he was a victim of Nazi Austria. So his parents were a very wealthy um, banker, a banker family, and he was able to flee Austria the very last minute. And he had to flee through Italy, through uh, Northern Africa, through Palestine, and he ended up in the ghetto in Shanghai, in the Jewish ghetto in Shanghai. And the Gestapo would follow them to Shanghai. And he saw kids dying because they were in this ghetto and because they didn't have anything to eat. And when he told me the story, I felt just terribly ashamed because I, you know, first had this feeling of that I had to be ashamed of him, but then I was ashamed of myself. And I think this has taught me the lesson of my life, always to be very humble, always to be very, very grateful, and always to treat everyone with respect, because you never, ever know their really true story. So Hans has really had a great impact on my life. And Hans, by the way, became the world's most famous translator. He was a professor at the Ashutti in, in Geneva because he could translate 32 languages. And what has taught him this resilience was he adapted because he had to survive on a daily basis. He had developed a certain system to translate languages with storytelling. So a donkey is crossing a bridge was a 25 digit number that he would translate in his mind and nobody could memorize it. So it was actually the beginning of the first AI in a sense, you know, but he did it in an analog way. He didn't do it in a digital way. So Hans has always had a very great impact on me and therefore I'm treating everyone. I really don't care whether it's the president of any country or it's the janitor. For me, everyone is the same. And I treat everyone with the same respect like I want to be treated. It's such a wonderful, wonderful story. And I, I, I mean, I'm really grateful that you shared it with us today because it's incredible uh, when you think about uh, Hans and, you know, what he what he went through, what his family went through and yeah. where he ended up. But also your, your learning too in terms of, you know, and we often hear it, don't we? And sometimes we forget that, everybody's dealing with something and everybody has a reason for the way that they act. And I suppose it touches back on culture and back on our own life experiences. Yeah. But just, you know, sharing that food and not understanding why he, he was 
asking, could he finish your plate? And it, it is amazing how it completely switches the conversation, isn't it? It can completely change it. And I'm I'm reminded yeah. of um uh you know the, the story of the the man on the train when uh he gets on the train, he's you know, he's in sort of a nice compartment. And uh but there's another man there just looking down, and his kids are running all over the place and they're shouting and they're screaming, and they you know, they're running past and hitting the newspaper that he's trying to read and it's just chaos in the train cabin. He was hoping for this nice, relaxed, you know, train journey. And he's getting more and more annoyed because the guy opposite him is doing nothing about it. And eventually he turns to the guy after putting up with this chaos from these children, just running around, screaming, laughing, you know, uh, basically in his view, making a complete nuisance of themselves in the carriage. And he turns to the guy and he said, you're not going to do something about your children. And the guy looks up from his shoes and says, um, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. I should do something, but we've just lost their mom and I don't know what to do. Oh, yeah. And within that moment, your perspective yeah. on the yeah. situation changes instantly because you have more information. Empathy. It's yeah. all about empathy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, and the reason I share that is because it, you, your tale kind of reminded me of that story. And it also it feeds back into this brand and why it's important that brands understand empathy, listen more and help, you know, make sure that they resonate with the communities and the people that they're trying to resonate with. And you can only do that sometimes when you have more information, when you understand a little bit more about what's going on. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, it's really, yeah, it's really welcome. good. Um, the other thing I want to ask you is about advice. Now, you obviously give out a lot of advice through the work that you do, or there may be some advice that you've picked up throughout your journey and whatever part of the world you were in at the time. But when I ask you that question, Emma, is there any advice that stayed with you that you think is really valuable that you want to share with us today? Or is there any advice that you often find yourself sharing with others that you can share with us? Um, I'm not really sure whether there is one advice because I think it all, it's like a gear. It's like, you know, being empathetic and um, listening to others, reflecting. I think it's all intertwined. And um, I might have not mentioned, but I also do coach um, female executives at sea level and at board level. And um, what really helps me helping them is just to be there and to listen to them. I do listen a lot. And I've noticed that it's also an art. The art of listening has become just so, so important, especially in our extremely intergalactic speedy times, because everything has to be, you know, you know, entrance seat pre-seat whatever you know it's it's everything is just very very fast and um but we do tend to forget that at the end of the day in order to understand the complexities of our lives of our economies you need to really deeply understand it and this only can happen when you can really listen very carefully so um it always helps me a lot when i'm advising my female executives because sometimes just by listening to them and then just pointing them into a direction you help them to help themselves you help them to realize for themselves what the next step in their life should be so i would say listening carefully and um giving advice but it's not like it's not like a big package that they unpack but it's just like something really small. It doesn't have to be really something big because sometimes it's the it's the small details that make a huge difference. You know, it's it's like we've mentioned culture a couple of times, and I think the cultural aspect in any company, in any organization, in any organism is very very important because culture drives mm, success. And culture generates value, value for the people, value for the company and value for the customers. 
Yeah, couldn't agree more. Thanks, Sumit. Um, the other thing I want to ask you about is, as you look forward over the next three, six, nine, 12 months, or even further, are you trying to do more, do less? Are you doubling down on something? Are you particularly focused on something? How does that planning process work for you? And what are you hoping to achieve over the next year or so? Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I think pre-pandemic, all these big companies, nobody could predict anything. You know, nobody predicted, you know, the pandemic. Nobody predicted uh, Ukraine, the situation we're in currently. Nobody predicted the supply chain issues that we have. Nobody predicted, you know, all these disasters that are happening right now. And we're still not seeing the impact of, of the natural disasters because we need to look at water and we need to look at cotton. Where is it going to be planted and how are we going to harvest it? Um, I'm not really sure whether um, I'm not in a big organization. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a freelancer, so I don't have to take care of employees or anything, but I have to take care of my clients. And um, I think empathy and accompanying your clients in this transformation process is probably the most important thing and i'm focusing on getting uh, the relevant information and distinct developments um, translated for their business because for example everybody's talking about metaverse right now everybody is talking about blockchain everybody is talking about quantum computers and there are just so many people out there so many self-proclaimed experts but what does this really mean for your business is this of any relevance or are these just like the big shining you know decks that you get presented by any experts does this have any impact on your business Yes or no. Um, I'm trying again to come back to the beginning. I'm trying to separate the chaff from the wheat. What's really important for them and to create a funnel and hopefully getting the right information at the right time to the right outlet of the business along the value chain. So that's yeah, in a nutshell. I, I like that. And it's, it's back to taking the information that we have at hand as much as we can and really translating that back into what's valuable right now for a company, for a business or for an individual. Um, it's interesting. You, you touched on quantum computing there, for example, and it's, it's kind of one of the things that's sort of out there and it might be in 10 years time. It might be in a hundred years time, who knows, but I was listening to a podcast that the financial times uh, media group published called tectonic and the, the the possibilities, if we can develop enough qubits, we're at about 100 qubits, maybe I think the world's biggest is IBM, a couple of hundred qubits, and we need like a million. Um, but they're very unstable. They're very hard to control. Uh, one of the experts talks about controlling qubits in, in the same way as sort of lining up a lot of kittens and expecting them all to perform in the same manner at the same time. It's a very complex science. But... Um, the, the 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 implications of it are staggering um but whether it's the metaverse whether it's chat gpt4 whether it's mid journey 5 or whatever you know by the time this episode airs wherever we are in the world of ai metaverse blockchain etc there's so much happening at such a rapid pace isn't there uh, that you do need to interpret that into your business because on one hand you don't want to miss the curve on the other hand you don't want to do something that's actually going to be potentially harmful to your business. So there's lots of lots of analysis, lots of reflection. And sometimes, I was talking to somebody very recently on one of these shows, they made the point that a lot of executives today, and I'd be interested in your view on this, Umid, that a lot of executives, whether it's that female executive running that you know company uh, or whether it's some global conglomerate, but a lot of the C-suite are probably operating one or two levels below where they should be operating at because of this rate of change and people particularly in management and senior management positions aren't giving themselves enough space to stop and think and reflect do you find that too when you're advising companies and brands and individuals um it really depends what sometimes a bit um surprising is that if you have, for example, a big company, you would presume 
but they are really, really extremely um, well advanced, very technological minded, and that they know everything, you know, it's just like everything is happening at the same time. But to my surprise, and it might be something Germanic, I don't call it German, but Germanic, because unfortunately, um, as far as digitalization is concerned, we have made a lot of mistakes in Germany and we have to close a very big gap because you probably know that in Germany, a lot of people still pay cash and um, we're not really where we should be, you know. Just to give you an example, so we have a puppy, uh, a bloodhound. So um, you have to um, register this dog with the municipal authorities to get a coin, a certain coin that the puppy has to wear around um, the collar. So you do this online and it takes literally 12 weeks till you get a response because um, it, they don't have the capacity, the systems are not compatible. And at the end of the day, you need to go there in person either to collect this coin or you can have it sent. But then if you would like to have it sent, you have to write either a letter or you have to send them an email. So both options or you fax them, you send them a fax. You know, who uses fax these days? Everybody. In Germany, everybody still uses faxes and overhead projectors. And if you thought this, anyone like 10 years ago, they would say, oh my God, no Germany. You know, Mercedes, Audi, Porsche. No, no, no. But now we're seeing that we're really losing in world class. You know, we're not this, this leading power anymore. So, um, and you'd be quite surprised when you talk to responsibles or to executives um, that they, for example, some of them don't even know what ESG stands for. What does that mean? Or sustainability, which in the meantime, I think is the most inflated term because it has been just too commercialized and everything is nowadays sustainable. So I would say 50-50. I would say 50% are well-informed, but 50% haven't got really the clue because they're focusing too much on the numbers, on revenues, on growth and everyday business. So there is a huge gap. And coming back to, to Gen Z, and I think they're really right. You know, we need to have more younger people that should be working together with C-level executives just to give them some, some fresh impetus. What's really important these days. Does yeah, that answer your question? It, it does. And it's interesting because you're giving both sides of the problem there. Sometimes they're really busy and technology advanced and, and everything. And so they're, they're missing some of the stuff. The other side is there's probably an education gap. You know, they're, they're probably not. They haven't moved. They're not far enough along on this digital transformation. And maybe some of the inputs that they're getting are not current enough or not different enough. And we see that, don't we, with the word bias. Uh, and when yeah. you talk about things like diversity and, you know, if if it's the same people talking about the same problems, there is no diversity, there is no different thinking, there is no different way of addressing or looking at a problem or sometimes, and unfortunately, I mean, a lot of companies have made massive progress here, but sometimes an organization doesn't have um, that sort of wider view uh, with different voices at the table. And I think that can be quite detrimental to brands, not just now, but in the future. I mean, significantly detrimental to them. Um, I think also, I mean, what you just touched upon last night, we heard on the news, you know, which again is a brand because, you know, we don't typically think of brands like, you know, washing machines, car consumables. But for example, the London police is also a brand. And last night they showed on German television that they, there was a report published that there are deeply rooted racist behavior and that a lot of people are just deeply aggressive. I mean, policemen, you would never ever expect, you know, the police force to be aggressive or, 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 or even, you know, kill people. What has happened with, I forgot the name of this young woman who was killed by a policeman, which was a disaster, which was so horrible, really, really horrible to, to hear. And um, it's, 
everything is a brand, you know, Simon. It's just like you can look from different angles, but we just, you know, it's it's in our it's in our capacity to make this world a better place and also to become more authentic. And you can only become more authentic by just becoming more vulnerable. I know a lot of people don't like this term vulnerability because they associate it, I think, with too, it's too intangible or it's just too soft or whatever. But I think you just have to open up and to become more authentic, you have to open up more. Yeah, I think the vulnerability is a great term because brands are starting to understand that basically if you want to communicate with humans, a human trait is, is you know, being a little bit humble, a little bit vulnerable uh, and maybe, you know, admitting to some of the mistakes that you're making. And I think... Yeah, absolutely. You, oh, that's the biggest part. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think on social media, you see that a lot. People are desperate for engagement, but it's only when they're actually being more real to who they are and being a bit vulnerable that they actually get the traction that they want not always but you know i think the more you try to make something look glossy sometimes the opposite effect happens to the one that you're looking for so yeah, yeah i think it's back to that human connection isn't it um so look thanks for that um there's, there's only as we come towards the end of our time here uh Umid, there's only a couple of things i want to ask you and they're, they're, they're kind of important one is is there any other area of your work or any other area in general that maybe I haven't asked you about, or it could be something we've talked about that you want to reemphasize? And secondly, and importantly, if people want to get in touch with you or find out about the work that you do or find out more about, you know, the services that you offer, where's the best place to send people to? Yeah, actually, there's really one area that I haven't um, spoken about, which has always really also dictated my my own DNA, and that's philanthropic work. So I've been doing philanthropic work since grade five, so long, long time ago. And I'm currently working on a film project. I'm working on a film project with a very acclaimed German TV presenter. And um, it's about it's about unconscious bias, and it's about how do we want to live together in a community with so many different ethnic influences and impacts? So it's a movie about um, a young German neo-Nazi who is um, basically attacking a Turkish restaurant in southern Germany and he's caught by CCTV and um, he is um, in court and um, the judge happens to be of Turkish background and um, the verdict is that he has to go to Turkey because he's an electrician um, to connect a small village to the electric grid. So it's, it's uh, the genre of the movie is called Culture Clash, which resembles, I don't know whether you've seen Monsieur Claude and his daughters. Um, a French movie about a French father with a couple of daughters and they all marry into different religions and ethnic backgrounds and um, it's it's told with a very twist with humor with intelligent humor and with a change of perspective so I'm doing the PR and the funding for this movie and we are just at the very very early stage and um so that's at the bottom of my heart, because I think it's very important, you know, to show people with intelligent storytelling in form of a movie that we're all different. We all come from different parts of the world. We all come from different walks of life. But at the end of the day, it's the dignity that's the most important thing and that we all need to respect. So I'm working on this movie. So anybody who would like to place a product in the movie and it's going to, you know, be in streaming, it's going to be in German cinemas, um, you can reach out to me via LinkedIn. I think that would be the best opportunity or the best way to, to get in touch with me uh, through LinkedIn, Simon, if that answers your question. Wow. I mean, that's incredible. I had no idea that you were working on that. That's very exciting. Umar. Yeah. I think so, because it, it's really, it's something very, you know, it's really fresh because movies always stay in our heads. You know, sometimes you can just remember things. I mean, one of my first memories is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, you know, Julie Andrews, you probably remember, you know, things like that. And 
and I think it's a great honor and it's a great privilege, you know, to be part of a, of a movie. One of the other things I would like to mention is that these days we tend not to listen enough to people with experience, to people who've had their journey in life and to probably made the mistakes, already made the mistakes that we are going to make in the future. So I think we've lost a bit of this, you know, when, when, when you were listening to the stories of your grandparents and you were sitting there in awe as a child and you couldn't believe all these stories. I think we've lost a bit of this magic of listening to people. And sometimes the best stories in life are being told maybe by somebody in your family or, or maybe your neighbor and maybe somebody would never ever expect. Um, and I think that's something we really should relearn and we should educate our, our children again. Yeah, I think that's a very valuable observation because in some cultures, multi-generational living is kind of much more uh, the norm. Uh, in other cultures, it's not, you know, you kind of reach a certain age and you, you, you don't live with your parents anymore, you know. And I know there are opportunities and challenges in both of those scenarios, but it it is incredible the amount of people that I talk to when I ask them about people that have, you know, maybe inspired them along the way. And they, they talk about their grandparents, um, you know, who may no longer be with them. But some of those sort of, and there's something magical about that missing the, the parents, you know, from the grandparents to the child. There is some kind of real, uh, really interesting dynamic that goes on there because quite a, quite a lot of people, uh, build such a strong bond uh, with their grandparents. Not that they don't have a strong bond with their parents, of course, but it is for people fortunate enough to to have that relationship. Um, there is something quite magical there. And I think what you're touching on as well is whether it's within your own family or outside of your own family, um, you know, with age and with being around on this planet uh, for so many years, you do pick up a little bit of wisdom. You do kind of figure things out the older you get. And I'm often reminded many times that there's, there's certain things where a penny will still drop for me and I'll go, why am I only finding out about this now? Why is this only making sense to me now? Yeah. Uh, and I think that happens to all of us, you know, Absolutely. it's kind of, we all learn at different paces and we all learn life's lessons at different paces, don't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, from uh, helping brands to tell great stories, you know, to be great storytellers, to producing movies and really storytelling in a different uh, area. I mean, that's been a, a really exciting and it's such a lovely note to end our episode on today of the global discussion. Uh, I just want to thank everybody who's been watching or listening to this episode around the world. Make sure that you like, follow, subscribe, do everything I need you to do to help support this podcast. And uh, I hope that people will join me back here for more discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. And the only thing left for me today to do is to thank Umit. It's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you again today, uh, Umit. Thanks so much for sharing all the wonderful insight uh, that you have on this episode. And uh, it's been really, really great to have you as a guest today. So thank you so much. I have to thank you, Simon. Thank you so much.